If Tim, had, come down. If, if you had some provocations already ready to go, perhaps. <laughs> that, yeah, we, we don't want to give that away. So. We can also incorporate uh, your questions and make that interactive. Yeah. Panel so, discussion. so it's interesting. I still work for IBM. Um, it's, it's but um, we still do this quite a bit. So David mentioned very briefly blockchain. Anybody know what? Blockchain is, you think we know what blockchain is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's something. Um, if you're looking for keeping up on the latest buzz phrases, you're going to start hearing it called distributed ledger technology. No more fundamentals to what it really is in blockchain. We need particular value of that. IBM and some of our best buddies, Intel and many others now, and we've been 17, I think. Have gotten together and formed something called Hyperledger, which is one of the larger blockchain consortia. Um, Ethereum had already sprung up on its own. Uh, they're competitive in some senses, they have to go off. And I can tell you why I've been in terms of We can go there. But what's behind that? is the fact that there's a recognition that having an immutable chain of ownership that you can track and, and use can identify things and can identify tasks. It will be used, it's already being used for tracking food, for safety purposes, where you can sell and recover. It's so cheap you can track individual food. Certainly you can track uh, small chains. Uh, you're going to see it, well, you've seen it with things like uh, Bitcoin, where we have cryptocurrencies. You can now say we have identified a value. How you establish the value is interesting. Bitcoin uh, is an interesting approach to that. But there's also um, Ethereum coin, there's, um, I should just forget the name of that video, I'm backing another one now. <clears throat> There's a number of these. And what they do is they allow you to say, here's a token of value. So I no longer have to exchange value for value. I can say, I've got tokens of value. I will give you some of my tokens, which I will establish. I will give you the thing that I want. And we track this all through our distributed ledger. So we're very much caught up into this notion of the value of joining public, open, innovative thinking, and then commercializing. I mean, it's quite So that was part of, you know, the thing that I find very inspiring. It fits into the system of the world. Um, there are a number of places like that uh, I find particularly interesting in all of this. This open thinking tends to use standardized components. My background goes back a long way in the software engineering. Uh, Twenty odd years ago, the big thing in software engineering was components off the shelf. The idea that you could take standardized components, um, I'll come back to what that means in a second, and glue them together and make software. And that's what we do these days. Most of our apps on our phones are done by people who have got off and uh, maybe they've used uh, Node.js, or they've used mm -hmm. Python libraries, or using lots of great hair and milk hair. You might use C++ libraries, or even C libraries. Code that was written by other people, and you glue them together in systems. The problem is, software engineers 20 years ago thought that every one of these components would be very carefully Described, they would be formally specified, they would be validated, they would be verified, they would be tested out. So each one of these little nuggets would be perfection. So when you glue them together, all you needed to do is look at the type of code you wrote and say, did they grab the right information from the right place, did they pass it in the right form, perfection would happen, and my job would be. Instead, um, I looked at it, I don't update my apps all the time. 
I have 79 updates. Probably 50 of them, maybe 60 of them, say, oh, we made it a little more efficient or we, we regularly fix bugs. Where does that come from? Where, where is this notion of fixing? So the challenge for me is how, with this, with this style, how do you get us back to a place where software does the job it's going to, it was intended to do? That's a different book, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it's, 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 you know. yeah. it's, this is some of the work I've been doing on pattern language. And so, again, coming around to things that we learned and forgot and have to reinvent, um, pattern language is on the agenda. Okay. And we'll come back. I think that's a, that's a worthy topic of discussion. <laughs> Oh, you, need you want the mic? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah okay. I, I, after taking the time to, first of all, to say wow, and then I'll just yeah. point out that uh, after taking the time to read the book, I had precious little time to uh, collect my thoughts, so I wrote it down. So I'm going to uh, primarily read uh, what I managed to put down today. Um, so no doubt uh, by now it will be abundantly clear to you why a poll, uh, this by the way, will take about 10 minutes. Uh, it'll be abundantly clear to all of us now why a whole book is very much in order for adequately containing the scope of David's knowledge and imagination. Uh, those who know David will be familiar with his encyclopedic knowledge of all things in and around systems thinking, including socio-technical systems, management systems, systems, uh, uh, service systems, soft systems, critical systems, theory and systems philosophy, to name a few. Further, I've found David to possess uncommon curiosity and demonstrate genuine intrinsic motivation for discovering whatever best passes for the truth of the matter in any given context. And to say that David is a bit of a stickler when it comes to process would be an understatement of vast proportion. The quality and integrity of the methodology he applies in is essential to his thinking. And when he's thinking about how, uh, uh, even when he's thinking about how to dispense with uh, theory and process all together and to just let whatever matters most emerge and reveal itself in the present moment. An important aspect of David's process is the dialectic. Maybe he would put it in different terms, but I can't resist the uh, sheer gravitas of intoning the phrase the dialectic on this occasion. If it had its own soundtrack, it would be something, some part of Beethoven's fifth, I think. Um, put simply, if David decides to zig, he would prefer if there were someone available to zag to serve as the foil and the imminent grounding for his Ziggy. And so what this means is that it's my duty now to, uh, by David's own request, offer some measure of substantive opposition or critique to some aspect of this book. <coughs> Though before I do so, I think it's only fair for me to point out several ways that he's clearly trying to hobble my efforts this evening uh, in this respect. Uh, first, by evoking our sympathies uh, um, uh, with his injured foot, coincidence? I, I don't think so. Uh, then he invites his family here tonight, <laughs> presumably to stare me down. Well played, but uh, I'm afraid not. And finally, stooping so low as to curry my favor with tasty post meeting snacks and refreshments. Well, sorry, not sorry, um, to say that I have no appetite for that. That said, I will begin by complimenting uh, the work that David has introduced us to this just now. Uh, David delivers in every way, I think, on the promises of the book's cover and liner notes. More importantly, uh, what follows in the subsequent 600 or so pages is immensely well informed by David's intimate knowledge and first-hand observation and interviews with IBMers, other IBMers, concerning IBM's open source activity over the course of a decade. On this basis, an empirical fact and observation uh, David, as you have now briefly witnessed, offers expansively researched and intricately articulated uh, theories and patterns that illuminate the nature of open innovation learning and offer many intriguing directions for further research, both pure and applied. But even more importantly, I think, is that few areas of study offer the broad scope and rich promise as is embodied in the phenomenon of what we call open source today. The wide-scale, near-universal relevance of open-source approaches today, combined with the profound impact that it's having across so many human endeavors, is readily apparent, and it's only just beginning. 
So David has chosen an immensely important and timely phenomenon on which to develop theory and inform future practice. For instance, just this past year, AT&T merged, uh, merged their e-comp platform into an open source project of the Linux Foundation. The Linux Foundation is built on the successes of Linux, the first open source computer operating system to challenge and in many, way, in many contexts displace the established commercial offerings from companies like Microsoft and IBM and stuff. With this and similar moves taking place in the telecom carrier data center, we see the beginnings of entirely open source telecom providers. And beyond the world of computer software, we have right here in Toronto a newly launched organization called M4K Pharma <coughs> that has committed to an open source approach to challenging prevailing models of pharmaceutical drug discovery. M4K Pharma is wholly owned by the Agora Open Science Trust, who identify as their sole beneficiaries open science and the public good. Their initial priority will be to develop a treatment for a rare, uniform, and fatal pediatric brain cancer presently only treated using radiation therapy with no beneficial chemotherapies available. While these may be stellar examples of open source in its most pure and earnest incarnation, there are also many shades of gray where the open source organizations are concerned. Some open source foundations are created and controlled by close, close groups with supporters, more resembling what is traditionally called a consortium, open where PR and marketing are concerned, but effectively closed in actual practice. But just like the incremental learning and experimentation of IBM, the data details for us, these other various shades of gray represent legitimate experimentation, testing, expansion, and innovation in the boundaries and behaviors by which systems of open source creation and production are rapidly and continually being defined and redefined today. And the influence of open source is in no way limited to software and science. It is influencing mechanisms with policy development, government service delivery, venture and community financing, and much beyond. So while I understand the reason for David's design of the book, why it is the book that he had to write, and quite possibly why it might be the book that only he could write, I personally would have traded a bit of empirical case study detail and some philosophical or anthropological esoterica here and there if it allowed for just a slightly broader treatment and discussion of the progression and impact of open source and open innovation learning beyond the software shop and into the wider world. But alas, there is no room for that. The book is dense, which is to be expected when synthesizing in parallel three distinct case-based inductive theory constructions of both the descriptive and normative kind, no less. Um, indeed, it soon becomes evident that in order to make sense of this book, one must construct for themselves, based on the evidence before them, an operational theory of David Ng's theory book. In support of such attempts, I offer two brief pointers for approaching this book, overflowing as it does with so much detail, structure, process, imagination, and provocation to further study and learning. My first piece of advice, with apologies to Shakespeare, the first thing to remember as you develop your theory of reading this book is the pattern is the thing wherein you'll catch the concepts of the aim. <laughs> for those not already familiar with the world, by the way, uh, Shakespeare could have learned a thing from David about doubling his word count. Um, for those not already familiar with the work of Christopher Alexander or technical notions of patterns and pattern languages such as David just alluded to a moment ago, it will be helpful to learn more about that in preparation for or in parallel to reading David's book. And in the spirit of that, I offer tip number two in the form of a little starter pattern. Copious footnoting for disclosing mega worlds of comprehension. I'll say that again, copious footnoting for disclosing mega worlds of comprehension. David might appreciate that pattern. Right? Knowing that a book of a thousand pages might prove too intimidating for many otherwise interested readers, David has tucked the other 500 pages into the footnotes. <laughs> as made possible by their much smaller font size. <laughs> Suffice to say, I highly recommend reading the footnotes. Think of it as getting two books, or maybe even three or four books, for the price of one. <laughs> so, uh, many thanks, David, uh, for this valuable contribution and your careful, comprehensive treatment of what is right now such a crucially relevant area of scholarship. Um, I just want to mention, over, over the years of our Systems Thinking Ontario group, we've explored complex models of social evolution, the circular economy, um, a variety of topics in ecological economics most recently, major developments in the field of cybernetics, to highlight only a few recent topics, 
nearly any and every subjects, theory, thinker, or phenomenon that can be alluded to in a brief title that also includes the words systems and or thinking is fair game for our group, it seems. For the benefit of first-time attendees on this special occasion, uh, Systems Thinking Ontario meets with much less formality, uh, minus the snacks, which, which again, I'll just say it makes me a little suspicious this evening, uh, and, and has softened my critique substantially. Um, on the third Wednesday of every month, uh, except in December, and we delve into a topic of interest to the group and then engage in sometimes lively, though always respectful, open dialogue to more fully appreciate that month's topic. We typically meet in and around OCADU, often in the room next door, over here. And if you're interested in learning more about the group, there's a comprehensive online listing of past sessions and announcements of upcoming sessions. On March 21st next month, we'll be learning about and discussing holistic product design systems for sustainability uh, with Saya uh, here. And uh, you're welcome to attend. You're all welcome to attend. So on this auspicious occasion, uh, just please join me in also uh, expressing our heartfelt appreciation of David's leadership over more than five years now in uh, launching and sustaining systems thinking. Eric, thank you. Dave. Thank you, Tim. Uh, can I throw out the first question? Actually, it was made, and you don't have the answer, you're just going to let it sit there. So one of the contexts in which uh, open innovation learning could be applied that uh, I haven't gotten to that point in the book to see whether it is explored would certainly be uh, the distribution disruption of education. And with, uh, with, with online education and platforms like MIT and Stanford taking, taking uh, the lead uh, with a number of different platforms that you could actually call the wicking, blogging, distribution of education, um, and with a theory of learning as well, why don't we actually see that much change in, in how education um, has taken shape? I mean, so we've certainly, uh, uh, not that there aren't changes taking place, they're very slow, perhaps, but, uh, just, uh, so it would seem that you know one of the ultimate forms of software is in how we how we teach and negotiate and learn and share knowledge with each other. So it's essential in oral communication, written types of communication. The, the exchange of knowledge, teaching, learning, and training is kind of an ultimate control or, or, a, or a proto control system. So it's how we often exchange and learn in the first place before it's encoded into the different practices that could be exchanged as well. Um, so, you know, so it would seem that would be, that, that your, your normative theory would apply to development education. So, so um, I could either leave that to explore in different ways, but I wanted to, because the, the question I was sitting with as a professor, as somebody who was, as other people in education try to do, try to change these systems, yeah. I'll, I'll respond to that. Yeah, okay. Okay, so we take the learning by doing, learning by making, and learning by trying. Uh, so how much in our education system are we actually permitted to do those things? So the learning by doing, getting one thing right consistently, tends to be something that they do. Um, Training. Now, yeah. learning by making, I, I think that there's actually a term uh, these days, and so uh, I, I, I do... Um, coach students, I, I was teaching a class and I had one student come up, I gave him the same advice that I, I give my sons on, on career, I said, do something real. Did you, like, you have to remember, I was a strategy consultant at IBM for like 12 years, it's not real. Do something real, and you know it's real when you're making something. And so I think there's a turn there, and so this is one of the reasons that I, I, I could say I'm hanging out at OCAD rather than at Rockin School, no. mm -hmm. is that I believe that the design community is makers. We, we don't make MOOCs very well either. We aren't, we aren't like just putting lectures out online, letting people follow them and do their own thing. We want people to come here and go hands on. That's true. But the, the third one of learning by trying, I think, is one that um, is not well received. Having the ability to fail and taking it as a point of pride should be something that we should be looking at. Uh, we need the opportunity to fail. And 
Uh, I, I, so I, I get to practice what I preach a lot um, when I get the opportunity to teach. And so for the past six weeks, I've been at the uh, University of Toronto teaching. And the students always get in this discomfort phase. So Peter seen we teach before, but they start off and they think they know everything and they get really uncomfortable. Yeah. And then by the end of the course, they tend to get comfortable again. But uh, getting to the point and saying that, uh, that in, in, in that class, I had students prepare content. I gave them, in effect, say, two hours reading, and then you have four hours to create a presentation about something you've never known, you never knew anything about. And these are master students at the University of Toronto in the information school, and they're looking at me and go, in four hours, we're supposed to you know, present stuff? And I said, well, yeah, but you're the, it, firstly, to be at the master's level, you had to have got, been really good at school before. You wouldn't have gotten into this program if you weren't good. And so we take a leap of faith here, and you only need to present for an hour, and you look at this stuff. And so all the students presented, and they did a really good job. But then they did the blogging afterwards, and the blogging was the opportunity for you now to see what is it they missed, and that, that the result of me giving a lecture. But in effect, there's, what, there's a way of looking at that, which is I led the students to fail. Now, we all understood that the purpose of this course was to learn, it wasn't to optimize. And so I told them, no one ever fails in my classes. They don't fail. You don't fail. But you have to give them the opportunity to make a mistake by trying, and then you go, I learned something. Yeah? Um, I think the trend of highlighting uh, is being accelerated and enhanced from open source. Source mm -hmm. source mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of the motivation or momentum behind the shifts in that direction are being driven uh, from the open source movement. I noticed in particular just this week I was looking up a group that, that was setting up both a wireless mesh network in Toronto. Uh, here they transition to auto Toronto. Um, and when you read through their material, it becomes clear that you know they're not experts in telecommunications. They're not they're not they're, they're not experienced hardware engineers. They're they nowhere near the qualifications of the people who in industry set up networks, let alone cutting edge mesh networks, which typically don't even exist much in the world of commercial providers outside of like a, a really large corporate campus right, to extend the wireless network. It, it's cutting edge stuff. And they're doing it with an ethos when you read the materials, basically nobody cut anybody else up. It's clear that they know that there's a lot of things they don't know. It's and it's clear that they are um, demanding, if you like. As a, as a token, as, as your ticket for participation, that you will be willing to fail, be open about failing, allow your coworker or your, your collaborator in this project to fail, and then you're all here to learn together. And, and that's a that's a real that's a sh that's a, that's a real mind shift. I think open source. Is, is right. cool. Let's take some questions. Uh, uh, Anthony, your your hand was already up first. Let me just uh, call you. Um, so, so thank you, David, for, for contributing to the group for all these years. I, I remember only too vividly that the first System Thinking Ontario meeting that we had <coughs> that that, uh, and that, and it was it was extremely eye-opening during my own master study. So I wanted to just thank you for that, um, and also to say that I've I've, I've been very curious about why you're curious about innovation, um, and um, tonight's presentation has started to answer that for me. So I thank you for that clarity. And then my specific question is, uh, you talked about knowing why, knowing how, and knowing whom, what, where, uh, whom, what, who, when, and where. Um, you didn't talk about know what. Um, and uh, I'm curious, uh, the context of my curiosity is that uh, if you look at the public policy innovation funding at the moment, and even a lot of the private sector innovation funding, it's all about funding stuff, IP. Um, of one sort or another, um, which generally speaking is not hmm. knowing why, knowing how, or knowing who, when, and where. Um, and it seems to uh, those of us who are promoting social technologies and social innovations that there is in fact far more opportunity in these three categories you've identified for innovation uh, than there is in the know what type of innovation. Um, and uh, yet the funding doesn't seem to follow this. And in fact we have more and more cases of knowing what innovation failing, because it didn't also think about knowing why, how, and 
uh, whom, when, and where. So I'm just curious, why did you talk about know what? Uh, and, and could you just sort of give us some thoughts about the current state of innovation policy and funding uh, in, in the province of Ontario and more generally? Okay, sure. So, so firstly, the, uh, the ideas of epistemic, technique, and prolesis come from Aristotle, and they're the three virtues. So we know why epistemic, and we know universities do uh, knowledge. Uh, technique, which is the know-how, and the know-how is not just an individual thing, it is a group thing. So uh, how do people work together is where you get methods from. But Aristotle thought that the ultimate virtue was phronesis, which is what is the impact on people? Um, and what, and uh, also from, from the, the branches that are there, uh, epistemi, know why, is universal knowledge, but we have the idea in phronesis that it's situated, situational. So it's a context. So if you've ever found someone that did something right at the wrong time, that's a lack of phronesis. Now, the um, work we're talking about on ontology is because I think that people are too focused on the equilibrium idea or the idealist idea that we can get to a certain place and know something. And, and, uh, and trying to move away from the teleological goal-oriented of going to get somewhere and getting more towards the idea that we should be learning and progressing like we do in biology, um, that you make some incremental moves and then you learn from that and then you make more incremental moves um, is, is the way I think it should be going. So my criticism of the public policy, uh, I actually don't like the idea of super clusters. Hmm. Uh, for, let's put it this way. Uh, I, I compare this to my, my son, who, uh, who at Ryerson uh, was thinking about, he, and he did very successfully in the case competitions. Because you know, students get together, business students, they do these case competitions. I said, this is a really bad design, don't you think? You get 100 students together, they all work like crazy, and then two or three of them win. This is a really bad system. Why don't, we, why don't you do and join something that's constructive? So we can look at everything being competitive and trying to create supercluster where we create a spike, but that's not going to be a long-term proposition. Um, I can cite the, the extreme case of that, uh, having been in Finland doing this research, because I was there in Nokia with 85% of GNP. And that, that's not, that was an aberration, that was not something they should have cared about. So, uh, Patrick? Uh, so, comment in question. We have a really big book to cut down into a small paper. Now, when you graduate in Finland, you're going to get a hot hand sword. <laughs> you can borrow that sword a bit ahead of time. And the, uh, I work in AI, applying you know, AI to fuzzier world problems, and I don't think there's probably a thing in your book I can't directly apply. You had indicated some very powerful forces, um, symbiosis and so on. I was thinking, did you have any thoughts on autonomous and innovation? Uh, Hmm. Yes, and so that's so in April I'm meeting with Jim Spore in Shanghai and Wuhan and we're spending a week together. And we the, the direction we're going, we're, we're uh, uh, so there's four of us, Susu Nosala, who uh, came to the RSD meeting uh, last year, uh, year before. Uh, and I were working together and uh, and with Jim Spore and with uh, Raphael Lar, who's on the on the IBM research, the design of the IBM research. We're working on that agenda. Uh, but Jim's focus has uh, Currently, been on uh, leaderboards. So, if, if uh, artificial intelligence is a very big area, and uh, and so he, he's actually running this week in San Francisco, I think, and then in mid March he's running in Finland <coughs> uh, conferences specifically on areas in effect where it is that uh, you want learning in artificial intelligence. So he's trying to create these ideas leaderboards. So uh, we're working that direction. But the direction we're moving is actually uh, less from science and more towards the arts. Uh, because we're finding, as I said, uh, science requires history and data, and we're on the leading edge, so we're trying to push through the arts for the first time. Okay. Um, uh, yep. and, and then, and then uh, I didn't remember your Yeah, so David, I wanted to thank you for you know, taking that big step forward and encouraging your students to fail you know, to, in the learning process. And I think the, the challenge that I've seen is that, you know, okay, so certain things in the marketplace support this failure thing, time to market. So you got to get it out there, you fail. 
However, there, there's a real big uh, elephant in the room of, around instant gratification that I'm, you know, the challenge. That's a challenge that I face in the, the work that I do, and, and as I suppose many of us do. And I, I just wonder, you know, in your in your travels, in your readings, like how is that playing against these, you know, this this need to fail, you know, this, you know, if you fail, then you won't be gratified. I assume. I, I don't know where, where have you seen that sort of dilemma. Uh, so, I, I, for me, actually, the division is between the material and the immaterial. And so, um, most of the things that we say in law, you lose on your pride, but there's nothing real that happens. Okay. So, um, talking about bringing out a new product, and uh, if you bring out a new product, you should bring it out. So, the idea of minimum viable product, yeah. that, like that, right? Yeah. You bring out a product and you learn, and the, the goal is to learn. If you bring out that product and it's static and it doesn't change, then you're going to be in trouble. But for, for me, the real test is, and what I've learned from the open source community is it really is all about seeing something material that has to get me on the top. And most of the stuff I'm seeing is not real. Hmm. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for this book. I, mean, I was not sure, sure whether I'm going to you know, read it or not. I think I'm going to read it now. So it was really uh, interesting. And, and I was surprised. I thought that you, the book would be about Python. I was not going to be able to work in both stuff at the same time, so it's amazing. Uh, so, what do you think about the, the, the way this whole thing influences the business model and the organization itself? Because, I mean, if I understand it properly, it's not only open source, and it's not only about innovation culture that people talk mostly about. I mean, it's, it's, this sort of interaction between having some innovation taking place outside the ecosystem, and then some inside, and then trying to sort of have the balancing act between those two in equilibrium. Um, so having sort of innovators or designers or knowledge workers inside the organization, which is like a financial firm, uh, producing something to offer you know, value, deliver to customer, but at the same time having similar kind of process, but very different kind of people who are not your employees, who are just some almost random people from the ecosystem, Engaging with you or among themselves uh, on validation, which, which is more of the platform. So, how do you see it? Like it, it was mentioned, education. So, one thing is to deliver education digital, which is most of the, the, the so called platforms to now with them and the others. They don't really co create knowledge mm -hmm. outside. And then we have the open source stuff, which is outside. But, how do you do you know, all these things together? And I suppose IBM or somewhat, based on your case studies, working exactly on this kind of hybrid fish. And, and so the, the, the net of this is that uh, open innovation is a great idea, but IBM probably spent six or seven years before it got it. And, and it's a big company, and it takes a lot of investment and trust in the people in order to do that. Uh, the, the, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but one of the things that I noticed, because I'm, I'm studying in Finland, of course, we're across uh, the United States, is that Canada is actually pretty unique right now in that it's following these ideas of openness <coughs> and immigration and all the open policies we have. Uh, in Finland, they've actually turned the other direction and they've, they've turned a uh, right wing government. Uh, every time I go there, the, the, my friends apologize to the government. Uh, and in the United States, uh, talking about moving, uh, moving uh, directions in the uh, as part of the case studies, um, I included uh, Obama's open data initiative. Uh, and if you look at what happened when uh, Obama was leaving and before Trump came in, if you, the, I had to go back and recode all the pages because it's no longer whitehouse.gov, it's Obama, white, uh, ObamaArchives.com. Hmm. They've taken all of the stuff that Obama did and they preserved on the web because the people were still working on their way out of the White House in January, I guess. Of, the, of, the, of that year, um, and uh, in effect, the United States has taken a step back. So um, I, the, I, it's, it's not clear to me how we're going to uh, influence the world that way, but Canada is more open to these art sort of ideas than I'm seeing in the rest of the world. Uh, everyone's going the other direction, saying, no, we need more private, we need more secrecy, uh, you know, we need more guns, and sort of stuff. Uh, that's, that's uh, I think, going the wrong direction. Any questions over here? The other side.
questions? Okay, uh, oh, a quick follow-up. We, we, we should adjourn. Yeah, we should. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we can talk to the, well, so uh, the author and all this will be available uh, for the reception. If I can join us now. And, and David, I'd like to uh, just thank you for for your presentation tonight and for for, sharing, for generosity and, and sharing both with the community, with us, the community at large, and assistance that we can carry. So. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. Please join us.